Rocky was novel in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, I saw it recently in Academy screening. To see it on screen was fabulous, and it's really, really good. And the thing that was striking was the script is astonishingly good. The script is why Stallone ended up in it. He had no, no force on earth could have persuaded anybody to put Sly in that movie, except that he owned the words. He had the power, and the words were good. And then the nature of that story, which is a story of luck, and of course it's plenty clear to me at this point that, that there's some parallels with my own story. That lightning bolt hit me too. I never did think of myself as an inventor. I thought of myself, first of all, as a folk singer. In the era when kids were folk singers, if you put on a blazer and you did Negro spirituals and you lined up and played your instruments badly, you were a folk singer. And then I thought of myself as a, as a movie maker because my folk career didn't end very well. And so I decided to put a studio together. We did all the inaugural really fun little films for the Sesame Street program. But for me to make a moving camera shot, which I always loved, we had to pick this dolly up and get it in a pickup truck and lay our rusty rails and put my pin-headed little Bolexes and tiny cameras on this vast dolly in order to move the lens 10 feet. I began to think that there has to be some way to isolate a camera which wants to move smoothly and a human being, which is always in motion. There has to be some way to disconnect the camera from the human, but let the human carry the thing. Because I loved handheld, but I hated this. I mean, the trouble with the handheld look for me is that that f frame, the edge of the frame, is a window. That's my window into this world. It's not our world. It's next to us. It's contiguous, you know. I don't like my window frame moving. I want to be able to see through it like we see by eye. And so I started to chase how to separate person and camera. And I came out with the machine that you will see in this bit of film that I still have, and there it is. There I am running around in a field, exhilarated as hell, because it actually works. And so just before I left for Los Angeles, just before I went to finally show it to the companies that were gonna do it, my then girlfriend, now wife Ellen and I, I went looking for shots that were impossible in Philadelphia because the shots wouldn't give away how you did it. That's the great thing about this gadget. Anybody who knew anything would look at the film and go, oh my God, what is that? It had a fiber optic viewfinder so that one eye is looking through this six foot pipe into the lens and the other eye is looking to see where you're running. So stairs were not a really good idea, particularly stairs that start and stop like the art museum steps. Well, we were there, you know, we parked up the top. We got a slate. I said, Ellen, let, let's, let's run down here. You run down. I'll follow you down, uh, and then we'll, then we're done, and I can go to L.A. By God, she she ran down those steps like a gazelle, and I I had a burst of adrenaline. And I followed her all the way down, and it was good. It was really good. It was better than the the other stuff with the older rig. Even though it was lighter, it was more stable, which was amazing to me. And I didn't fall down, which was great. <laughs> and then she ran back up. And I ran all the way back up after I kind of ran out of steam about the last landing. There are a lot of steps in the art museum. I mean, then that was just the art museum. Now it's an icon. Thousands of people run up and down that place, and it's become a symbol of something, personal achievement or having accomplished something, or even just the dream of doing so. But just then, it was just us. And Ellen started to run, and I put the rig on, and I started to run down behind her. Well, I mean, here you go. I mean, this is what's happening now. People are coming from all over the world, you know? <laughs> it's great. Tour buses full of wrestling fans pull up down here, and they all run up these steps. Look at this. Look, look. This is fabulous. Isn't that amazing? This has become a big deal, you know? Uh, but back then, we just did it. And Ellen went all the way to the bottom, and then she came back up, and I came back up behind her. I do specifically remember there was grass in between the steps. I mean, the steps were just the steps. They weren't an icon. Now, Rocky and Philly and the Art Museum are all part of the American experience. You see people come from Australia in tour buses, and wrestling fans from Melbourne come charging up the steps. And then they all take movies of each other. And then they gather around and look at the movies. It's unbelievable. 
There's 72 steps here. And I went off to Los Angeles, sold that rig in one day flat to the first company that we showed it to. Within months, the man who was about to direct Rocky, John Abelson, saw that demo and he said, oh my God, you know, how did you do that? And where are those steps? And that's why that shot is in Rocky. And that's, it's a killer because within a few months after that, I was chasing Stallone up those steps because that film came on like that afterward, a little B picture in Philly. As they say, the rest is history. So suddenly I'm shooting Rocky in Philadelphia. Rocky was a B picture that would have been looked down upon in any film capital. It was a tiny production. And we had shot uh, moving shots all over Philly, chasing him through the, the uh, railroad yards and under the arcades near the Independence Hall and up Broad Street at the very first light. And the combination, uh, the city never really seen in Hollywood, the you know gritty eastern city, those long streets with the, the row houses, the L, uh, elevated train going by, which of course we'd wait for and have a guy a block away queuing us when the train went so that that very evocative thing could happen in the background. Uh, Sly's brother, you know, singing around a lighted barrel of trash, which is a very Philly thing. And finally, the most amazing, wonderful shot, which is probably the first vehicle shot ever made like this. We drove up the middle of the Italian market. And I sat in the back of a van with the doors tied open on an apple box with this camera because it's a vile road. The van is bounding around up and down. And here's Stallone running, you know, now running like a god up the street, you know, uh, looking very self-confident, I must say. And uh, he got the attention of people on either side, the vendors for all these fruits and vegetables, because that's what happens at this market. You know, we ran through cascades of, you know, the the stuff that was pouring out of the old bins, old fruit and the stuff that didn't sell and so on. And guys would throw him an apple spontaneously that wasn't planned for. And the shot that followed it was down on the docks where this uh, ship from the grain trade, the Moshe Lou, had just been tied up. We swung around and shot out the side door of the van and we drove along parallel to the Moshe Lou and Sly ran. He could run really, really fast. We're looking at that ship entering the frame and Stallone is running fast and we're, you know, we're driving along and he puts on a burst of speed for real, no special effect. He goes faster and faster and the shot again has that sort of godlike serenity with this ship entering and him speeding up and the very next cut is he's headed up the steps of the art museum. I mean, you couldn't fail to knock an audience flat with that, and boy, did it ever. Rocky is, of course, important to Philly. We kind of feel like, at times, I suppose, like an underdog because we're 90 miles from New York. My, I was, as a filmmaker, overshadowed somewhat by New York filmmakers. But I think that there's something more than that. I think that there was something startlingly realistic and unpretentious about that movie. There was something so heartfelt in it and so without guile. And that was a time of a very peculiar time. And to have that connection with a, a guy like uh, Stallone's character, Rocky Balboa, was unusual. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't elegant, it wasn't slick, it wasn't contrived, it wasn't, it wasn't sophisticated. It just felt inevitable from the first line. We shot stuff everywhere in that movie that had never been done before. The stuff in the ring, the stuff in that meat locker. There was no way in the world to make that shot weaving between those sides of beef unless you have, happen to have the old brown stabilizer. Because how else are you going to do that? So I, I had the camera out here and I was holding these beeves uh, out with my, my hand was greasy from pushing them out of my own way and trying to sneak through there. I love that stuff. I love to move the camera. I love the three-dimensional look of it. I love the way it tells you things about a set when you move. It tells you the shape of objects. Even though we're looking at a two-dimensional medium, 
when we start to move, we're actually going through these right eye, left eye positions, and we understand the shape of objects. That, I think, is the thing that pleases me the most, is that we've sort of handed off another instrument in the orchestra. Now we come into the arena, the sports arena in Los Angeles. I was there mainly because I could be certain that the punches would sell. And the idea is if, you, if you're faking a punch, there's really only one good angle to see it. The best angle to see it is just that over the shoulder where you, you have the wide angle effect of the boxer's head snapping back to you, but you can't see the point of contact. Now, of course, the trick is make the punches look like they're real. And the reason I was in the ring, in the sports arena for our few days in the ring, was to try something brand new, which was the camera circling around, looking over the shoulder of one fighter or the other, almost the referee's eye view, if you will, which had never been seen in the ring in this kind of very fluid way of being able to circle with the fighters, because they're always circling, circling, circling. You've got to see it either over the shoulder of the guy throwing the punch or over the shoulder of the guy receiving the punch. And both instances, it looks really real. In the case where you're over the shoulder of the receiver, you have to be prepared to jerk back out of the way if you're close, because Sly threw his head back with fantastic energy and really good timing. So we shot each round with me in the ring, and then we sh cleared me out so the other cameras could work, and I just hovered around in the outskirts and pretended to be a dolly because the quarters were too close to have a dolly, and in an overhead shot, you'd see the rails. So I was able to be useful down there as well. I did forget to remove my very distinctive striped shirt, so of course you can see this odd striped shirt person who looks like he's carrying a sewing machine wandering around, maybe standing by in case someone's boxing shorts were ripped. I mean, who knows what I was doing. It's funny, I, I expected, of course, that everyone on Earth would immediately want one, and I did not take into account how conservative even a business like the movie business is, uh, uh, by and large, and it was the bold, self-confident people that uh, that went for it right away, that knew what they wanted and went for it. It was Haskell Wexler and Hal Ashby for Bound for Glory. It was John Avildsen and company for uh, Rocky. And it was the late, great Conrad Hall and Schlesinger for Marathon Man. Those three films signed it up right away. I worked on all three alternately, which was an amazing experience for me. And it was when we started to teach people how to do it and run these study cam workshops and, and democratize it and let other people in on it and sell them all over the place that it became a phenomenon because then everybody's energy you know, was involved in being able to do this magical thing with a camera and to persuade other people to do it and so on. And that's really when it took off. It turns out to be not just a tool but an instrument. It turns out to be an instrument that's capable of being played with great sensitivity, not not as a show-off kind of thing, but as a, you know, an ensemble instrument in the act of filmmaking, an instrument that puts the lens in the most subtle way where you want it at the moment and does something in terms of coming at you, you know, where it isn't a zoom, it's we're moving through space, but we're not calling attention to it and waving a flag and, you know, shooting off firecrackers. We're, we're closing on you. Well, let me give you a quick tour of the machine, all right? Um, it's, it still works the same way that the prototype worked 30 years ago. Uh, we fell into probably the best way to do this little trick, or otherwise somebody would have done it differently. But then and now, it's uh, a gimbal, which is a lovely bit of goods that isolates the camera in the angular sense. Right, Ben? This is Ben. Hi, Ben. An arm that acts like a tireless spring-powered arm that never gets tired. Poor Ben may get tired, other parts of him, but the arm will never get tired. A spread out mass so that it's very inert, you know. It feels like roughly what, the Lusitania in terms of mass, right? Pretty tough. The Queen Mary too. And then a video monitor so that you can see what you're shooting. Because if you tried to have your eye on the finder while you're walking around, it would never work. So as it turns out, the combination of spread out mass, gimbal, arm, and monitor, those four things, uh, were the basis for a patent that lasted its entire life. It was never successfully busted, and it is still the way these things are made all over the world. We love that. 
what I've continued to do is invent stuff. Uh, it always kind of surprises me, but it usually comes for the same reason, which is somebody needs or wants something, or I want something that doesn't exist. And so I've kept on uh, doing it in the years since Rocky. I, in the early 80s, invented something called the Skycam, which is a stabilized camera on wires that are you know, taken up and let out by computers so it can fly anywhere in a football field. I did a camera called the Moby Cam that chases the swimmers underwater for the Barcelona Olympics. I did the dive cam that the camera falls with the divers in Atlanta. They're all, oddly enough, derived from the original conception of the study cam. There's something about balance in the end that is why the study cam is elegant. It's clear watching somebody do it that the object itself has a poise of some sort. Sly came to the American Society of Cinematographers and handed off an award to me a couple years ago. And I said to him at the time, that was a fantastic gift for all of us, that movie. Thank you for that. Thanks for that script and thanks for that idea. It was a great experience. That shooting was in nearly 30 years ago. We've all, of course, been through an amazing amount ever since. And uh, I think we're all getting now a remarkably mellow and beginning to really enjoy the after effects of having done that remarkable thing in that remarkable time. Wonderful time in the movie business to, to make that little uh, bit of innovation and that kind of a movie.